My work often leads me to dark places. Violent crime, murder, and the pain left behind. But when I meet people like Carla Brooks, who triumphed over a terrifying ordeal, I'm reminded of people's inherent strength and goodness. This is all new for me, and it's also uncharted territory for the police and for the courts. Not long after I met Carla, my techniques, and it felt like my entire career were about to be put on trial. I'm Cece Moore. For years, genealogy was my hobby, and then it became my career. Soon I realized that the techniques I developed to reunite families could also be used to identify killers. Now my team and I help the police hunt violent criminals. I'm a new kind of detective. When I first joined forces with Parabon in April 2018, people were thinking about genetic genealogy as a tool for a cold case. But it only took a couple weeks for things to change when I first received a new opportunity to really extend the boundaries of what genetic genealogy could accomplish. That was the Carla Brooks case. Carla Brooks was 79 years old. She's lived in St. George, a town in southern Utah, for most of her adult life. I married Carl Brooks after we'd gone together for a year, and uh, that would have been in 1965. I was his queen, and we never argued. He'd just say, everything will be okay. So that's the way it was. Carl died in 2015, and since then, Carla had been living at their home in St. George alone. We never had any trouble up here in our little quiet neighborhood. But then when this happened, it was, uh, it was really horrific. 911, what is the address of your emergency? Hello, 911? Hello, this is Carla Brooks. On April 17th in 2018, I was in bed. I was asleep and it was dark and there was just a nightlight in my room. A fellow came into my home, and uh, he rubbed my shoulder. And just because I was asleep, I thought, well, that's Carl. And I turned around, it wasn't. And he put a rag in my mouth, and then he clenched it like this, and whipped me around with my neck this way and that way and this way. And I fought, and I fought like a tiger, but I didn't win. After he had gone, I was so overwhelmed with it and so hurt, and I cried. I just couldn't believe it. I'd been raped. Our police department has 11 detectives, and each of those detectives is assigned a certain area. There's sex crimes, there's people crimes. I cover property crime, thefts, burglaries. But on the week of April 17th, 2018, I was on call. And about 1.30 in the morning, I was contacted to come in and, and process the scene and to conduct an interview of the victim. A sexual assault on a uh, elderly female, to me, was extremely different. And I thought, how would my own grandmother feel sitting down with a detective and just describing in, in full detail a sexual assault? They asked me what color his hair was, how tall he was, how he got in. Carla said that he was a white male and had uh, dirty blonde or dark curly hair and possibly in his 30s. She suspected that he came in through the sliding glass door. This door right here, he came through this door right here. I can't lock that door because it kind of goes at an angle, so I can't lift it up to put the lock on it because it's so heavy. After we interviewed Carla, we drove Carla to the emergency room where a sexual assault kit was administered. When I heard the details of the case, I just couldn't imagine my mother, who's the same age, being in that position. The crime scene was rather simple because uh, there wasn't a lot to process. We documented that room with photographs and 
We fingerprinted all the entryways looking for any uh, additional evidence and we didn't locate any. Once we were finished processing the area, we left with one major piece of evidence and uh, it was um, the DNA evidence left by the suspect. In Carla's bed, police found a large semen stain. We bagged the sheets as evidence and we reached out to our Utah State Crime Lab. They were able to build the DNA profile and they submitted that into CODIS. We had to wait a few weeks to get that information, but we were hitting any and every kind of lead that we had. We conducted a canvas of her neighborhood. We focused on people who had surveillance systems or doorbell surveillance cameras in hopes that we would catch a glimpse of uh, any suspicious activity, but we weren't able to establish any type of uh, suspect. In today's world, you usually see crimes that might have more of an electronic trail. Maybe there's surveillance video, maybe there was cell phone records, something like that. And in this case, that just wasn't there. I was surprised that they had so little other evidence outside the DNA. But I was still pretty hopeful that we would get a good hit off of CODIS. This is a very egregious crime, and it seemed like someone who might have a criminal history in the past. But they got the results back, and there wasn't a match. CODIS is only as good as what's been uploaded to it. According to some studies, CODIS is biased toward minorities and people of African-American or Latin American descent are disproportionately represented in the database. According to the 2010 census records, St. George is over 80% white, or as I would define it, of primarily Northwestern European ancestry. Three weeks after the attack, we've exhausted all leads. I just had already made up my mind that they'll never find him. But what worried me was that he would come back and he knew exactly where she was. He was still out there. So there is more people at risk wherever this guy went. We needed to catch him as soon as we could. So we had to do something different. And so I started Googling DNA. I thought if genetic DNA technology can be used to solve cases that happened 30 years ago, why can't it be used on a case that happened three weeks ago? It was definitely out of the box uh, thinking, so I really started looking into genetic genealogy and I came across and got in touch with C.C. Moore. This was not someone who had been in contact with Parabon. So when Detective Wilson reached out to me directly, that was a first. And it felt very, very different. This was not a cold case at all. I had no idea that it would be C.C.'s first hot case. I was working on exclusively cold cases. I knew that an active case would be even more intense, but it felt extremely urgent. And it was a heavy burden knowing that this person was still out there and could strike again at any time. When Detective Wilson wrote to me, I immediately responded because I was really interested in the possibility of such an active case. If active cases utilize genetic genealogy going forward, thousands of cases could come into Parabon in the coming months and years. And that is really exciting to me. But I knew it was a big deal because this case could have a significant impact on the future of investigative genetic genealogy. So I decided I wanted to learn everything there was to learn about this particular case. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I was kind of thinking that we were going to have this wrapped up in a, a week or two. And when we got zero results from CODIS, mm -hmm. it kind of scared me a little bit. Like, this is, uh, I don't want this to go cold. Yeah. And you know, I, honestly, I was getting desperate and uh, was surfing the internet for any type of DNA information. I mean, I was like, who's CC Moore? And mm -hmm. I got to looking into what you did. It was pretty impressive. It was unusual for someone yeah. to reach out to me directly versus through Parabon. Well, Carla's incident, in my opinion, is everybody's worst nightmare. Did you know Carla before? No, but the case perked the, the community up. She was a school teacher for 30 plus years, maybe. Yeah, she seemed very beloved. Did Carla inspire you? She sounds like she was a very unusual survivor. Absolutely. 
was clear that the person that Carla is made this have a profound effect both on Detective Wilson and the greater community. I came to teach in St. George in 1964, and then we built this home in 71, and it was wonderful for the children because there's all kinds of kids up here, and we had great friends. But it's changed so much. Once Carl wasn't here, it was very difficult. I've been through lots of things, but uh, when this happened, that's a whole different situation. But my mother taught me when I was young to love everybody. So I just said, well, if somebody goes through what I have to go through, then maybe I can help them. News for Utah's Lauren Mathias spoke with a woman who says the attack changed her outlook on life. As Carla Brooks explains it, she days after the attack, Carla was spending her time doing activism. Carla says she wants to help other survivors. She donated $5,000 to the Dove Center, a shelter for women in Southern Utah, as well as the Children's Justice Center in St. George. Carla is continuing to raise money to help organizations that help survivors of sexual assault. You can Carla, from the beginning, she had come forward, and I knew who I was doing this for. That's very unusual in a rape case that I would know who the victim was. For Carla, her driving force throughout her whole life had been helping other people, and that just continued even as a survivor of sexual assault. I can imagine for someone like Carla, who's elderly from a tight-knit religious community, that it would be especially difficult to have to report a crime like this. When this happened, people would tell her, hey, we, you don't need to tell anybody about this. You don't need to talk about it. I think in a small place, you think, oh, I can't say anything. You know, but if you know something's wrong, if you're trying to make something better, there can't be any fear in doing it. She's strong, very strong. Huge example to, to survivors. It was a top priority case for me and for my department. And uh, I think it was a top priority for the community as well. I could understand why the community was so motivated to find her attacker, hold him accountable, and also to protect her. I absolutely wanted to help identify this suspect for Detective Wilson and for Carla. And so that was the decision we had to make was, do we want to prioritize this above people who have been waiting? And we had this whole queue of analyses that we needed to do on all of these cold cases. But the CC was looking at the details of this case and said, if we can find him now, let's do it let's figure out who that person is as soon as possible before they can do it again there were dozens of cases waiting for my attention but we decided to push it to the very top of the pile no matter how difficult it is and no matter how long it took using genetic genealogy for the first time in an active case is historic and i was excited about how it could impact the future of crime solving but I was also involved in another historic event that could have an even bigger impact. In the summer of 2019, the very first case that I ever worked on for law enforcement was going to trial. Last year, I worked on the Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kylenberg double homicide in Washington State. It had been over 30 years since they had been murdered. The investigation moved to this area beneath the high bridge near Monroe. That's where the body matching the description of 20-year-old Jay Cook was discovered yesterday. Cook and 18-year-old Tanya von Kylenborg were first reported missing November 19th when they failed to return home to Victoria, B.C. from a trip to Seattle. Tanya's body was found alongside a rural road near Mount Vernon. In 1987, Jay and Tanya were murdered, and investigators tried everything they could to identify their killer. But very quickly, over a matter of only a couple hours, the genetic genealogy pointed me right toward William Earl Talbot II. His DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene 30 years earlier, and the police department arrested him. He denied having anything to do with it and pled not guilty. The Talbot trial was incredibly important for the future of this revolution of crime fighting. We had had some convictions already on cases that I had worked, but they were all through guilty pleas. There had been 
no precedent set. So this was the first time where a judge and a jury were going to weigh in. I knew that the outcome could potentially dictate the future of genetic genealogy and law enforcement, and thus my work for people like Carla. So a lot was at stake. Everything was on the line. very important to see the outcome of these cases because I get emotionally invested in them. This is some raw footage of the William Earl Talbot II trial that I was able to get access to since I didn't get to be there. Very nice, a female judge. A landmark trial opened today in Washington State. The trail was cold for three decades. Then police mined a public genealogy database and found a suspect. It's the first time this controversial forensics technique will be tested in court. The trial is expected to set a precedent on the use of family tree forensics in police investigations. The first case that I worked on was the first case that went to a jury trial. Even though the Golden State Killer suspect was arrested before William Earl Talbot, the William Earl Talbot, the second case, made it to trial first. If it hadn't been for genetic genealogy, we wouldn't be standing here today. There were lots of eyes on the William Earl Talbot, the second trial, because the future of investigative genetic genealogy relied on the outcome. In the fall of 2018, I was assigned to prosecute the case against William Talbot. Frankly, it was the first time we'd even heard about genetic genealogy as a new forensic tool. I started thinking about some of the potential legal issues surrounding uh, the use of genetic genealogy. And one of the most obvious ones is thinking about it from a legal privacy point of view. Was the way that the police got to Mr. Talbot a violation of his right to privacy? Was uploading um, this crime scene profile to a public DNA database, identifying relatives and family members through the genealogy process somehow overreaching by law enforcement. Um, people are wary of having that kind of data exposed. See the picture. So our goal was to make sure that genetic genealogy was presented as really just another lead like the many others the police had gotten before. I was scheduled to testify as an expert witness in the Talbot trial, but at the 11th hour, I was informed that they had decided I did not need to be a witness. We reached an agreement with the defense to allow the detective, Jim Sharp, to talk about the work that Parabon and Cece Moore had done, including the results implicating Mr. Talbot. It's disappointing to not be part of this historic trial and get to be up there with the families and Detective Sharp in person. A genetic genealogist was able to determine who contributed that DNA. One question you will not have is who was responsible for those extremely violent murders of Jane and Tanya. And that could only be one person, and it's Mr. Talbot. Talbot's lawyer told the jury the presence of DNA does not mean his client is a killer. Genetic genealogy that you heard briefly about here. Um, the, the prosecutor said it's a good tool for catching perpetrators, uh, which is inaccurate. It's, it's a good tool for giving prosecutors an insight into who left particular biological evidence. Whether that person was the perpetrator or not, um, other evidence would need to show that. If there was any type of negative ruling regarding the genetic genealogy use, if the judge uh, disallowed it in this case, this could make or break what we're doing. I want to be able to provide answers to the victims and their families. Even if it's a very cold case, it always feels like a race against time. But this was even one more step, because with Carla Brooks' case, now it was potentially a life-or-death situation. I felt a lot of pressure knowing that this person was out there and potentially still active. So I wanted to get that DNA processing as quickly as possible so I could jump right in. The only hurdle that we had with this is the, the funding. But we still we ran it up the, the chain, and we got it approved. I was able to go to the crime lab up in Salt Lake City and pick up the sample, and I overnighted the, the sample to Parabon. Most of the cases that were being analyzed for genetic genealogy are decades old. This was a completely new thing. 
We pride ourselves in innovating around here. It was particularly exciting because this was our first active genetic genealogy case. There was a definite urgency, not just with CC, but with all of us involved. I really felt like if I didn't find him in the next couple days, there was a good chance that he could strike again. On the weekend of July 6th, 2018, I received the matches from GEDmatch, and I didn't want to wait another hour to try to help identify Carla's attacker. So uh, our call rate was really strong in this case. It was 98.4%. Now, why is it different? This is an active case. So this is a fresh DNA sample. There was a grouping of matches, and that is our first genetic network. And the match at the top was about 185 centimorgans. They're possibly second cousins with this unknown suspect. A couple other possibilities. Every generation, the shared amount of DNA is halved, approximately. If they're second cousins, they share great-grandparents. So I'm gonna make sure I have the tree going back to great-grandparents. And there was a second grouping of matches who shared DNA with the unknown suspect, but they don't share DNA with the first genetic network matches. This is genetic network number two, the different branches of the family tree. My top match is only sharing about 70 centimorgans with this unknown suspect. So maybe a third cousin. So I'm gonna make sure I have the tree going back to great-great-grandparents. So now what do I have to do? I gotta build their family trees, right? I'm trying to find their common ancestor. The common ancestral couple for genetic network number one was Charles Morris and Elizabeth Margaret Hanna. Charles Morris was born in 1875 in Boston, Massachusetts. He not only had three degrees from Harvard and he practiced law, he even worked as secretary of the Woodrow Wilson Businessmen's Committee for the League of Nations. And so this was a well-established family. They had seven children, six who lived to adulthood. So for genetic network number two, the common ancestors were Amos Holdeman and Nancy Yoder, married about 1829 in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which, by the way, I have ancestors from. They were both in the Mennonite community. They had nine children, all of whom lived to adulthood. So that's a pretty big family. Next, what I have to do is start building forward in time doing that reverse genealogy. Coming down from the common ancestors and building forward is much more time intensive. Those trees just get huge. Somehow, those two genetic networks I had identified had to come together and triangulate in order for me to find Carla's attacker. I was concerned on this case that that was going to be really challenging. And I kind of hit a brick wall. And I'm just working and working and working and working to try to get that little glimmer of hope, that little glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. And I don't even stop to eat. So if I didn't have Leonard putting food in front of me, I just wouldn't eat for a few days, which is the way I used to be. <laughs> I'd be a lot thinner. <laughs> I ended up with two genetic networks, but there was a third aspect that was really important as well. And that is that I was seeing lots of matches that had full Puerto Rican backgrounds. And I thought, oh, how interesting. It's certainly a clue because the unknown suspect had to have some Puerto Rican ancestry. So that means that a descendant is going to have to marry or at least have a child with someone with a Latin American surname. So when I follow this hypothesis in the first genetic network, I found that Charles Morris Jr. married Dorothy Grace Rivera. Aha, that's promising. Dorothy's father is William Rivera born in Puerto Rico. Hallelujah. So now that I found the Puerto Rican ancestry, I can eliminate the rest of the family tree for genetic network number one and focus in on that one branch. But there's always snacks. Always, 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 always <laughs> snacks. <laughs> this family was based on the East Coast. They were apparently pretty happy where they were, so they weren't coming west. And I needed to find a family that somehow ended up at least near St. George couldn't find them. So I really needed to have that second genetic network point me in the right direction. And I run into a great grandson of Amos and Nancy Haldeman, who dies in St. George in 1973. Ah, finally, finally. His name is George Monet. I 
know that the suspect has to be descended from him. And he also has to be descended from genetic network number one through Charles Jr. and his wife, Dorothy Rivera. George Monet, his grandson, is about the right age to be the parent of our suspect. Who are his grandsons? Do they marry someone from the Morris family? So I find a granddaughter of Charles Morris Jr. and his wife, Dorothy Rivera, who has the same first name as the wife of one of the grandsons of George Monet. And I start thinking, what if this is the same person? And she is indeed that granddaughter. So she had gotten from the East Coast all the way over to St. George, married George Monet's grandson, and they had a family of eight children, four boys and four girls. So what this meant was my genetic networks had all converged at this one family that had four sons. When all the pieces come together and it's in the right location, it can't be a coincidence. The unknown suspect had to be one of these four brothers. July 6, 2018, I barely got any sleep. But in the end, I knew that it had to be one of the Monet brothers that was Carla's attacker. On July 9th, we were contacted by Parabon and we were gonna have a uh, conference with CeCe Moore. I was amazed that's happening uh, so quickly. When I was able to provide these leads to Detective Wilson and his team, it was the biggest relief to date. We were looking at four possible strong suspects. The Monet brothers, they all grew up here. The oldest brother was Spencer Monet. The police find out that Spencer has a warrant uh, here in Utah. It's a small traffic warrant, no big deal. So I decided to give him a call and he informed me that he forgot all about that and was more than willing and cooperative to get it taken care of. Detective Wilson informed me that Spencer Monet was scheduled to come into the police department. So I was on pins and needles. On July 28th, Spencer showed up to the St. George Police Department. When I get to the office, uh, Spencer is in the interview room with my sergeant. Hey, Josh. Hey, Spencer. How are you, How you doing, man? Good. I had a warrant for his DNA, and I was ready to take that from him. Spencer is not a person who has uh, been in trouble before. He has no criminal history, but still we didn't know what was going to happen. Your marital status, married to the divorced. divorced. Any kids? Three boys. Oh, wow. Getting enough sleep? Nope. <laughs> no, I told Detective Wilson I'm sleeping in my car a lot, so. Oh, it's not good. Oh, oh, reasons. We just talked about your divorce and some situations, so there's some things in your life going on that are a little bit rough right now. I would like you to be honest with us tonight about a case that we've been working since April. Um, I'm going to present to you with some facts that you know about it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that night. I was drinking and walking around. I just remember going in the back door and some glass sliding door. I was looking for trouble, you know. I was. Like I said, I was pretty drunk, and um, I just remember going down the hall. I don't really remember the house. Just keep going. Um, he went down the hall, and then what? I saw that she was in the bedroom, and I went in, attacked her. I held her down, and. Um, He provided us a full confession. My jaw was on the ground. I didn't expect that at all. He wasn't doing so good, and he was making some some wrong choices in life. I've been just kind of going through it, and I felt like I was losing my kids. There's no excuse, obviously. I just, it's been something that's replayed in my head over and over again my whole life. That kind of um, sexual fantasy, basically. I collected his DNA, and we sent that to the crime lab for verification, and it came back as a match. There was no doubt that we had identified Carla's attacker and that she was now safe, 
and I was really happy to hear that Spencer took responsibility for what he did. Over a matter of only a couple of weeks, he was stopped before he hurt anyone else. Tight fit. I think he was ready to have this off his shoulders. Spencer was charged with rape, object rape, burglary, and assault. We booked him into the jail on July 28th, 2018. I went over to Carla's house. He knocked at the door, and I thought, oh, he's just going to come to see if I'm doing OK. But he came right into my house, and he had tears in his eyes. She's looking at me like, oh, why are you crying? And he said, we caught him. I was so grateful. I knelt down and thanked my Heavenly Father that they had caught him. It was a great feeling to sit there and just look at her face and feel pressure leave her body. It was unbelievable. It was clear that genetic genealogy could be extremely powerful and effective in an active case. We were able to provide Carla and her family answers very quickly. It's a good example of how we can avoid letting violent criminals go free for years or decades like they have traditionally in these cold cases. However, at the time I was working the Carla Brooks case, a judge and jury had not yet ruled on the use of genetic genealogy for law enforcement purposes. And a lot was writing on how things were going to go in the Talbot trial. Every day during this double murder trial, Tanya Van Kylenberg and Jay Cook's family members sat in the public gallery. During the trial, the prosecution presented evidence pointing to William Talbot as the killer. We know his DNA is a match. There's no question that genetic genealogy led to the contributor of that crime scene DNA. But it's up to the jury to decide whether there is enough evidence to convict. Is there still room for reasonable doubt? Attorneys making their closing arguments Tuesday, but the defense saying nothing other than DNA connects Talbot to the couple. If you are sitting here thinking, where is the other forensic evidence? Your answer is not guilty. It's a cloud of dots to begin with, but when you follow the dots, you end up with a picture. And that's really the approach that um, I encourage you to take in this case and find the defendant guilty as charged. When a jury goes away to deliberate on a case, it is uh, nerve-wracking. A first-of-its-kind trial is now in the jury's hands. Jury deliberations begin in the morning. One attorney telling me they should have a verdict by week's end, though it could take much longer. It was very difficult for me to imagine what they were thinking, what they were going to decide in the end. I didn't think this was necessarily a sure thing, so I was nervous. There was a lot of eyes on this trial waiting for the outcome. The jury deliberated for about a day and a half. I didn't really know what to expect. Maybe the jury would decide there wasn't enough evidence to convict. The jury returned with a verdict on June the 28th. This is the family. These are the people that I am most concerned about. I am sure they are extremely nervous right now. After 31 years, 31 years of waiting. State of Washington versus William Earl Talbot II, verdict form one. We, the jury, find the defendant, William Earl Talbot II, guilty of the crime of murder as charged. It, you know, it is impossible to put into words. Everybody here followed the trial closely. It's an important milestone because now we have a conviction by jury. As important as it is that there was a conviction on a case where investigative genetic genealogy was successfully applied, it's even more important that this family has a resolution. I'm John Van Kallenberg. I'm Tanya Van Kallenberg's older brother. Our family is very grateful for all the people that helped bring this to fruition. C.C. Moore moved this case forward very quickly. Steve Armitrout, Parabon, all of whom contributed very significantly. And really, you know, their core value in that gene genealogy community is about helping families. And I think that's what you've seen them do today. Now, this one trial doesn't put 
all of the questions about investigative genetic genealogy to rest. There are other upcoming trials that may handle it in a different way. So this is not the final word. There will be an appeal. And so a lot of the issues that, that came up at trial uh, will be tested then. Whether um, the, the case is submitted to the Supreme Court for appeal after that um, won't be decided for, for several more years. There will be challenges. We can be certain of that. But you know, we're very confident that genetic genealogy as a practice is going to survive. I anticipate that the outcome of this trial means that there will be many more cases that will utilize genetic genealogy going forward, and we should be able to bring answers to thousands of victims and their families just like Carla. Spencer, he admitted to it. But then the next thing sets in. What's going to happen now? I'm calling the case of uh, State versus Spencer Glenn Monet. Months later, when Spencer had his sentencing, Carla and her family all attended. Spencer pleaded guilty on February 28th. Carla also spoke at that sentencing hearing. I'm Carla Brooks. Spencer, I'm glad that I couldn't see your face that night. So I can look at you today with no fear. I also want to say for you, and for me, that I forgive you. Carla's such an amazing person that she publicly forgave Spencer. I can't imagine what that must have been like. I have wanted to meet Carla Brooks for a very long time. I was really looking forward to the opportunity. I hear it from so many sexual assault victims, how ashamed they are, how guilty they feel. I think Carla is such a great role model to show that you don't need to feel that way. Hello. Hi. I'm Cece. Oh, come on in. It's when I got your case, I felt a lot of pressure because I was afraid that he might strike again. I knew you That's were. That's what I was afraid of. Right. But Josh was the main one that talked with me, and he's been so good. He just never forgot me. And when he came in, he said, we found him. I just went in the shock because there's been so many people who never get to find out. Did you feel safer after that then? Totally safer. Really? Totally safer. It's amazing that you were able to forgive. Well, thanks. Spencer, for what he did. It right. says a lot about you. You can forgive, but you don't forget. Carlo was at a place in her life where you wouldn't expect somebody to kind of reinvent themselves. But yet at 79, she wasn't done. She was willing to make a choice that helped others rather than thinking of herself. We can still make a difference in the world and fulfill ourselves and make our families proud of us. You see it? Yeah, see that one? I've been really lucky that my family's been so supportive. My son hasn't always gotten as much attention from me as maybe he would like or I would like to give him. And so there's definitely been sacrifices that my family has had to make and that I've had to make. You can see Jupiter and Saturn's right over there. Uh -huh. And then there's the one under Jupiter, which is like Antares or something. He still knows he's the center of my world, but I finally feel like I'm living my life's purpose because I'm able to use genetic genealogy to bring answers to victims and their families and to make society a safer place. Genetic genealogy was never intended to be a career. I could never have envisioned it leading me here, but yet I somehow ended up here. It's been an incredible journey so far, and I don't think that's going to stop. But who knows what the future will hold for me, for my family, for my career, and for genetic genealogy.